G'day guys, I'm Dylan Buckley and welcome back to Friday Knockoffs, brought to you by our beautiful friends at Pepper Jack. This week on the show, one of my favourite teammates of all time, absolute beautiful person, a little bit weird, it's Cade Simpson, 300 game superstar, he's working with the AFLW and he's got some very, very weird superstitions. I'm going to ask him about him now, he's actually waiting, see you later. Oh, how are you Sim? Oh, good, mate. Sorry, How mate. Are you? Friday knockoffs. Just finished work. Nice, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm oh, very well, buddy. Yeah. Very well, yeah. Um, how's your week been? What are you doing these days, mate? You keep me very busy. Uh, yeah, I had a bit on this week. Um, so I still work a couple of things at the at the footy club. Um, AFLW is just about to start up and then do a bit of stuff with Carlton College. Um, and then, yeah, a bit of gardening later in the week, uh, Thursdays and, and today, so... Beautiful. You're a very, very busy man. AFLW firstly, so much to unpack here. They've got some good news throughout the week. What does that season look like? It's very exciting for the girls, getting a bit more, a bit more of a longer season. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the agreement they've just come to with the AFL, it's, it's great. It's obviously moving forward um, in a big way. So now we've got 18 teams in there. Um, still going to be 10 rounds this year, but I think uh, hopefully in the future that will grow and uh, mm. lengthen the season out more. Mate, it's a weird one. Um, I don't know if you'd ever even think that this would be happening because a, a long time in footy, but the Blues are absolutely humming. But what are your memories of it at the moment? Even like thinking about them going so well now, could you even imagined it? Uh, I was probably optimistic that it, that it could happen and happen this quickly. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's really good to watch. I think the way they're going about it, um, I don't know, just, you, there's something sort of in the air when you're watching them play. and. Uh, the way they handle themselves, um, whether it's Vossi or or Cookie coming in as well, but like I've, I've seen or heard the word humility thrown ar mm. around a lot. Um, I just yeah, it's really good to watch, and and the way they the way they're going about it, it's just awesome. Is there anything that stands out to you that you know you're in the club, you're working a little bit with College of Sport, you said, and the girls team it, as a whole of club now from when you were there? Is there anything changed specifically, or is it just momentum? Because I'm a big believer in like sometimes when you can just get those couple of good wins on the board it can all change and I feel like it has been bubbling for like two, three, four years but without the wins it's hard to capitalise and people don't think you're actually doing too well. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you get the results, um, they'll probably, they started similar last year I think but they were probably just losing games mm. so this year they've, they've, they could have lost a lot of their games that they've been in, they've been challenged but they've just done enough to win um, and as you said momentum picks up and now they're confident and guys are, guys are playing their role which is a big thing as well I think. You've got Obviously, some special players in in Cripper, Charlie, Walshy, those guys. But then you've got these other soldiers that are just getting their job done um, week in, week out, and they're probably being rewarded for it as well. Yeah, good. Um, speaking of momentum, your career started with a little bit of a slower momentum. This story has been touched on a bit, but th three games in a row, zero stats. Is that true? Yeah, three. Yeah, three in a row. Second game only played two minutes. So. Yeah. So to context, a little bit different back then because there wasn't as many rotations. Yeah, well, that, there was there was none that day. <laughs> um, yeah, I still I still remember it. We were playing Richmond at the G. Um, had all the friends and family up up in the stuff in the stand. I reckon I punched out about six or seven k up and down the boundary line, just doing just doing run throughs. So um, yeah, didn't get near it that day. The Blues won, but yeah. It was, it was so did you actually come on the ground? Yeah, I went on the ground. I think someone was having a set shot, so I ran out on the ground. Uh, I reckon the goal went through, and then as they were setting up for the centre bounce, the runner came out and goes, Simo, off you come, mate. <laughs> so literally out there for about two minutes? Two minutes, yeah. So, <laughs> mate, if you probably the highest paid player that season for minutes, uh, cash per minute. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, in all seriousness, how long did it take for you to start getting that confidence and, and start playing consistent senior footy? Was there a time or a first early game where you thought, no, nah, I'm actually good out here, I can, I can do it? Um, yeah, there's still one one game that sort of sticks out in my mind that it sort of happened. We were playing um, St Kilda. I had a bit of a role on Aussie Jones, so um, I was tagging him. I was going all right, did well, kicked a couple of goals, and then I got injured during the week, and I missed the following week, and I was like, ah, bloody hell, I'm going to have to come back through the twos again. Um, I only missed the week, but came straight back into the seniors, mm. and I think the, that sort of made me feel like I belonged. Um, coaching staff having faith in me that I could just slot straight back in. Um, so that would have been maybe 10th or 15th game or something. And then I think the back end of that, I played the next sort of eight or nine in a row and sort of finished the year off pretty well. And, and then that was leading into my 
ball off the year, so mm. um, had a good off season. But I reckon that was sort of the, the turning point that people having faith in me, knowing that I was capable at the level, sort of gave me that uh, self belief. Was there any other lessons that you learnt early? Like you think about that now, it's crazy. You're a young kid, you're not much bigger than you were now back then. You're know, literally a really, really small guy. What were the biggest le lessons that you sort of learnt early? Was it just being confident in your own body that you can match it even if you aren't as big as everyone else? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think, yeah, confidence, self-belief. Um, back then, though, I like, feel like it was a pretty hard sort of game as well. Like, the training was hard, and I remember, like, our seniors would play Friday night and have the weekend off. Our twos would play on the Sunday. We'd turn up Monday morning. If the seniors didn't go well, we'd be doing 400 mm. sprints and stuff, and it was sort of like you just had to... Just had to, <laughs> you just had to get through it. Um, so probably a bit of mental strength as well, knowing how to train when you're not feeling the best or, or perform when you're not feeling the best as well. A um, couple of lessons. And that's something that you know I admired most about you too, was even when you were you know 40 years old and <laughs> playing for your 300th game, you still trained, you still did the full pre-seasons with all the young guys. What is, was that something like a message you were trying to send or was it even just a message to yourself that you could still keep up? Yeah, oh, probably a bit of both. I think um, towards the back end of my career, I really enjoyed the, the challenge of having to get up every week and mm. doing the extra recovery or the extra prep. But um, I remember hearing Boomer Harvey say one once that um, like he barely ever missed a training as he got older. And that sort of really hit home with me about in the off-season, doing as much as I can, and then pre-season, trying to prepare my body as much as possible for the the rigours of mm. the AFL season. Um, yeah, and it just hit home with me and, and I just become obsessed with preparation and, and training and, and just trying to do as much as I could. Incredible. Hey, Simo, Pepper Jack, all about character. You've got plenty of that. Um, I've got a question for you. What value do you admire most in others? Yeah, good question, dude. Great question. It's Pepper Jack, hard-hitting character. <laughs> um, well, I think loyalty's a big one for me. Um, yeah, someone who's going to stick by you through thick and thin, um, even if you're not going well yourself, that they're just going to always be there for, mm. whether it's a shoulder to cry on or an ear to listen, just something like that. I think those people um, I really respect and I've got plenty of them in my life, so I'm very lucky. It's uh, two are glaring, well three, your, your wife obviously Dee, but one, two others, sorry, your mum and your dad are ones that have just been staples throughout your whole career. Um, I don't think, did they miss one game? I think throughout the COVID seasons, obviously they couldn't get there, but they seemed like they were at literally every game of your career. Yeah, they, they enjoy it. They st they're still getting along to the footy now. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what they, I, th I thought it might have stopped once I retired, but... Um, that probably says that maybe it wasn't so much about you. Yeah, it's probably. More just probably. About her, yeah, the I definitely, m mum's a bit of a social butterfly, so um, any chance she gets to catch up with the other parents and, um, and hang out and, and have a chat, she's all for it, so... Um, yeah, no, they, they were a great support right through juniors. They were always involved in my football, but then just driving me to games. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, they came and watched most of my footy throughout my career. One thing um, I loved about you, and it's something that a, a really strong message that you gave to me as well, and even for a lot of young kids out there listening today, is like about being yourself, being embracing your own size. I remember. Um, coming into an AFL system, you can worry a lot about size and, and trying to put on weight and be big and strong. But for you, you worked out quickly. That didn't work for you and you, you just embraced with what you work. Can you talk a bit to that and how sometimes you just got to work out what's best for yourself and not necessarily, um, you know, coaches and fitness staff can know what's, what's best for you? Yeah, so especially like when I first started, it was a very contested game and a bit old school where you needed to be big and strong. Um, so I put on, I think I put on maybe... 12 kilos in my first couple wow. of years and one of those pre-seasons was the worst of my life like I just couldn't run couldn't carry it um, and then yeah then yeah, I just slowly stripped back down and and probably the game changed as well a little bit where you needed to be fleet-footed and, and be able to run and skillful um, but yeah I think like you just got to as you said find out what works for you like it just because they're getting a, like Crippers big and strong and huge, like that's not going to work for someone like myself or even like a Walshie like who's running. He's put on weight, but he probably doesn't need to be as big as Cripper. So um, having you, everyone's got talent that's on an AFL list. You wouldn't be there if you didn't. So just finding out what works for you. Um, everyone's got their own little niche, and and then I think that's the great thing about our our game is that like you've got small forwards, you've got guys that are 
six foot eleven, but um, anyone could, any shapes and sizes can uh, succeed. Speaking of other guys that you respected as well that had that similar mindset, who were some players that you played with across your time at Carlton that might not have known, you know, the public might not have known how, you know, maybe mentally strong or how important they were to the team? Um, yeah, good question. Um, Quite a few players. There I've, is I've, one one that springs to mind that might be similar is someone like Andrew Carazzo. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and off the back of that, someone pretty similar as well, and Ed Kerno. Mm. Um, both guys just oh, mentally tough and, and driven, um, and you probably see that a little bit with guys on that rookie list that some that come through because they're so um, driven to succeed. They um, they, you start off as a rookie list, it might take them a few years to get going, but then they play 200 games. Mm. Um, and it's probably to do with their mindset and their, their mental toughness. So, yeah, definitely those two guys would stand out as um, a massive influence on myself and the team and the way sort of people train and, and the culture of the club, I reckon. Hey, long sleeves was something that was also quite big in, in your setup. I want to talk about the whole setup too, because I've never quite seen a man that prepares like you do. It's very <laughs> uh, analytical. There's, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Talk us through maybe like your pre-game routine, choice of jumper, choice of boots, the way your socks are put up, so that little bit of white tape that you put um, <laughs> underneath as well. What were some of the things going through your mind in, in terms of this setup, and why did you do it? Yeah, it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was, it's pretty busy looking back at it, but when I was doing it, it was just preparation for a game. Um, and it was something that I just probably just built over my career. But um, the white, they had the white tape that stuck out just at the top of the, um, the sock. That was, uh, I was a big Andrew McLeod fan. So dad used to do the stats for Adelaide when they came to Melbourne. So I watched a lot of Adelaide games and Andrew McLeod was a favourite of mine. And he used to have like the, I think he wore white socks under his mm. AFL socks and he'd just have about a centimetre showing um, and he was pretty handy, so that's why I sort of stole that from him. Um, yeah, I just always, like, I just sort of built my preparation. There was so much of it, like, I was always last into the team meeting, last out on the ground, last off the ground, um, didn't touch the banner. Um, yeah, socks and shoes always done up, try to get them impeccable. But I, I, I just sort of... There was lots of other things as well, like the radio had to, when I left the car, it'd be on a, the volume would be on a certain number. Um, so looking back, very tiring, <laughs> but it was just sort of routine and something that I felt I needed to do to prepare to play well. Was there any players that ever tried to, to challenge you in the last out on the banner room? I feel like <laughs> over your time, there might have been some guys coming in from trade that would try and challenge you to get out last? Uh, maybe. I, th I know early days Fev was always last out, so I was second last out while Fev was at the club, and then when he left, I, I sort of took that. Um, but I think once you sort of, there's a bit of that seniority thing there, so I'm, mm. I don't even know who's taking it up now. Maybe Sauce might be out there last now. But um, yeah, I think there's a few guys that would just be sort of happy to come come out second last. Love it. Hey, um, Sim, I've got to show you something. This is uh, <laughs> on my phone. Friday knockoffs, obviously exclusive. Now, I know um, incredible career, but there was some there was some down times in the career, and this one um, was one of them with our friend Ed Kerner. We spoke about him earlier. Do you remember this? <laughs> I actually don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that vision? Do you remember the time? Because it wasn't the first time this had happened. I, I think it was my last year, so in the hub, pretty ordinary year to, <laughs> to start with, and then fly over to Perth, we're in lockdown for two weeks, couldn't even leave our hotel, and then wear a Sharon straight in the face. Um, it was pretty, I think it was wet too, I don't know. It was dewy. Some people just, say, actually, Carl, that was the first um, target Ed Gurns ever hit. <laughs> I reckon I used that as well, but <laughs> I, was, I, don't, I just asked him, like, why didn't you just pick it up and handball it to me? Like, <laughs> um, no, yeah, I, it, was, it was flat. I do remember it, but... I just remember, like, I was a little bit embarrassed. I'm like, geez, I've just worn one here. So I worked so hard to make sure I got a touch in the next yeah. sort of, like, minute. I ended up getting a mark out on the wing about a minute later. I was like, at least I've, at least I've got it in my hands now, make sure I hit the kick. Oh, there was um, another one as well, which I'm, I'm not sure if you remember this too, because it was quite a big hit, but for some reason your head was a target for balls. And this was a pre-game um, <laughs> oh. against Adelaide with a young, uh, young guy named Nick Holman, who's obviously at the Gold Coast Suns now. You actually formally got him to list it after this, I think. <laughs> but you were running, you kicked it to him, he kicked it back to you. His ball drops just gone off the side of his left foot and straight back in pre-game. 
Yeah, yeah, pre-game, just a bit of lane, just a nice bit of lane work. I've kicked it to hit Nick Lace out, and then I was just off to just off to the side, <laughs> about ten metres away. And then, for some reason, I'd, his kick's gone at right angles and just flushed me <laughs> straight in the eye. I've, I reckon there's a photo going around where I'm after the game where I've got this shine and they're like, oh, you must have copped one during the game. I'm like, no, no, just before the game. <laughs> um, yeah. It was it was impressive. Um, I've never seen someone still yelling at a player of their own team throughout the game about a kick done in the wall. Oh, but I couldn't believe it happened. That's why we love you. Um, mate, AFLW, let's just go quickly back to that. So you rolled this year with them. Um, how much time is that taking up in your week and where do you think the Blues can go? Yeah, so... Line coach last year, yep. looking after the forwards, now going to be head of development. So a bit of a bigger role. I sort of, at the end of the year, wanted sort of more hours in the program. So yep. Carlton have sort of created this role. One, it's just to give the players the best chance to succeed. So I'm, I'm there a couple more afternoons a week. Um, so really I'm just there. If the players finish work early or study or whatever and they can get in in that afternoon, mm -hmm. um, not on the days where we actually have training, um, I'm there to do some crafts, some touch, whatever, whatever they want, vision, any of that sort of stuff to sort of help them get better as players um, because it, it's limited the time you can have with them. So um, if they are floating past, I'll be there just to, just to help out and try and further them. And you've had a lot of senior coaches throughout your time. A lot of coaches walk through the doors of the Blues. What have you taken from any in particular? Is there some that you stand out now and that you've finished going, I really like the way you did this? Oh yeah, there's plenty. Um, like, 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 Bolter's work ethic, um, incredible. Uh, had Dale Amos as the backs coach for six years, and just his relationships and knowledge of the game. Um, Lukey Power, head of development in, in the men's program, is um, probably the best I've seen in that space. Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely will be trying to pick Luke's brain and and just sort of see how he goes about it. One, I saw that firsthand, but now just sort of get him, uh, get in his head and sort of pick off a few little drills here and there. And um, But I think the big thing is just always having time for the players and being available. Mm. Um, you're just a, a tool for them to use to get better. What's the goals in the coaching space? Do you know what you want to get to? Like, is it to work across a men's and women's program? or? Yeah, ultimately I'd love to... Um, I'd love to be a PDM in the men's program and then continue working in the women's program as well. So um, PDM, player development manager, so it's a little bit more sort of off-field, um, but I do really like that space and the well-being of players. Um, so that's sort of where I'm sort of tending to lean. Whether that eventuates, um, we'll just have to wait and see, but that's sort of, I've done like the courses and the study um, for that moving mm. forward. So hopefully a position will open up. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd really like to be across women's and men's. So um, I really enjoy the women's space, but I do want to be sort of full time in the men's program as well. Yeah, yep, I'm sure it will. Wealth of knowledge, my friend. <laughs> you know everything about it. Um, you weren't a big fan of the media when you were playing footy. It's hard to even get you on today. I can't believe we absolutely <laughs> landed you. What, what was the reason behind that? Uh, again, probably when I first started out, it was sort of... <laughs> But my first coach, Dennis Pagan, was like, there was a bit of news about you or you were in the paper the, the day of the game. It was sort of like, gee, son, you better get a kick today. Yeah. And then, which I like, I didn't mind that, but I just sort of, again, like, I loved playing footy, but I didn't really enjoy the, I like, I still liked my privacy and stuff yeah. as well. So I didn't want that to change. I'd like to be able to go and have a coffee or to the shops and stuff as well so it's not that I didn't like doing the media it just made me a little bit uncomfortable um, so yeah I've, I've, I've done a couple of things for you now Bucker so you might be my kryptonite I am I am kryptonite <laughs> hey we spoke about routines earlier Friday night routine as a player versus Friday right night routine uh, now what's the difference uh, it's a lot more relaxed now a few beers a few pepper jacks yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, no, nah, I just, I, now I just sort of, yeah, I enjoy watching the footy. Um, now I'm just sort of a, a fan, so I don't like watch a heap of it, but if there is a good game of a couple of top teams playing, I'll, I'll really sort of sit down and, and, and watch. Um, probably it's frustrating watching the Blues because mm. I know they're, what they're tr sort of trying to do and what they're trying to execute, so um, 
but really enjoying the way they're going about it this year. Love it. Sim, for coming on and having a chat with oh. your old mate. I've got you a nice little bottle of Pepper Jack. I know you love these ones. Yeah. Enjoy that tonight while you watch the game. Thank you very much, Dale. Good to catch up, my friend. Pleasure.